Welcome to Jewish History Soundbites podcast with Yehuda Geber. Immerse yourself in the rich tapestry of Jewish history as we explore fascinating tales and uncover hidden gems from our glorious past. Brought to you by our proud sponsor, Cross River, a leader at the intersection of financial services and technology committed to empowering the communities they serve. Cross River's steadfast support fuels our mission to preserve our heritage and foster a vibrant future for all. Contact Cross River through their website at crossriver.com. A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11 Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games. So geheiz waren die Brüder in Amerika. So kauft und schaffen es das Gitarre. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in heaven. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut and who said. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little. It is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Yehuda Gerber. Yehuda with Jewish History Soundbites. And before we get to today's episode, which is the beginning of a new series, I <coughs> want to mention the situation here in Israel. Um terrible situation, and hopefully we'll get out of it very soon. Our thoughts and prayers are with everyone, uh, the wounded, the kidnapped, unfortunately, the um, those who lost, uh, lost mem- family members and friends, and of course all the soldiers out in the field, um, on the front lines. Um, this is, you know, very historic, what we're going through, the scope of this tragedy, has not been seen in the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and it's still at the beginning. We probably haven't been able to process it yet. And I even hesitated to record a, a podcast at this time, but I feel that, that uh, you know, this is a, it's also a good distraction. I believe that there's even soldiers on the front lines who will listen to this uh, episode, um, and it should be a good distraction for them as well. Um, and it also, this uh, series that I'm going to be launching now is about the escape to Shanghai. Thousands of refugees, including the Mir Yeshiva, who escaped to Shanghai uh, during the World War II, beginning of World War II. And that's also can resonate as a saga, a story that even in the darkest times, there are uh, points of light, uh, such as this miraculous escape to Shanghai. And we should merit many much much more light now um, in this dark and challenging time. Um, so this this new series about the great escape to Shanghai, thousands of refugees in war-torn Poland and Lithuania, um, including the almost the entirety of Mir Yeshiva. Um, and this will be an ongoing series. It'll probably be like seven or eight parts at least. So the next couple of months will be involved with this. And if you think that this is a series that other friends of yours will enjoy, uh, so tell your friends and family about Jewish History Soundbites, um, and uh, you can um, you can even help the podcast by uh, leaving a rating and a review on any platform that you listen to. And of course, I can be contacted for any comments um, and questions and sources and trips um, at yehuda.yehudagaber.com. So, we um, will, uh, while our hearts and prayers are with uh, everyone here in Israel at this time, we're going to go from there into um, this series. And I feel uh, that, in a way, this is a very famous story. Uh, At the beginning of the war, in the summer of 1940, and the beginning of 1941, um, thousands of Polish-Jewish refugees 
they are in stuck in in Vilna, which initially was independent Lithuania and then gets incorporated into the Soviet Union, and they escape using these Dutch Curaçao visas and Japanese transit visas of Chuyuni Sugihara, and the Sugihara visas enables these refugees to traverse the Soviet Union. Of course, they have to get Soviet exit visas as well, and they're able to make it to Japan, where eventually some of them make it to the United States and other places, but uh, many of them eventually get dumped by the Japanese imperial government in Shanghai, China, where they live out the war. And what's most famous about that story in religious circles is the fact that the Mir Yeshiva, a large chunk of the Mir Yeshiva was with them. And in a way, this is a very famous story. And say, why is Jewish history soundbites rehashing this famous story? And we'll see, we'll discuss that there's uh, some new angles and some new insights and some new uh, uh, material that uh, I'll bring to this uh, story as well. Now, there's been, even though this is going to be a seven or eight part series, there have been previous episodes which I've already touched on and discussed the topic. I did an episode on Nathan Gutwirt, uh, who is the Dutch tells yeshiva student in Kovna, who was in Kovna in the beginning of the war, who was able to, uh, um, get, who, was, who, him among others, the Lewin family as well, were able to get the uh, um, the Dutch Curaçao visa started with Jan Zwartendijk and LPJ de Decker, the Dutch consuls in Lithuania and Latvia, respectfully. Um, and um, I did an episode on him and his role, there's, I did way long ago, I did it way back, I did an episode on Rameir Ashkenazi, the legendary rabbi in Shanghai who assisted the refugees, the Mary Shiva and everyone else. I did also, a long, long time ago, an episode on Feng Shanho, the Chinese consul in Vienna who assisted me, many Viennese Jews in getting to China. I did an episode on Rabbi Malin, who was the center of the story of the Mir Yeshiva getting there. Just recently I did an episode on the mirrors who didn't make it, so it was not the entire Mir Yeshiva who went to Shanghai. It was perhaps half or a little more, majority of the Yeshiva, but we discussed that then. I also had at one time an episode on the international dateline controversy, which was of course related to this story as well. During their time that they spent in Japan, there was a question of where the inter- halachic international dateline is and about what the correct day is to observe Shabbos. So there are several episodes that deal with this, but still this one is, this is really going to cover it from A to Z and really make it a clear and, and, uh, and, and great, fascinating and interesting and narrative. So there's an enormous amount of sources and all material that has been devoted to the topic. And um, there's this is a like I said, a very famous but very misunderstood topic. There's many books that have been written on it. There's the Hebrew classic three-volume Hazricha Bepa'ase Kedem, with all its limitations, and it has quite a few limitations. It's still a timeless classic. There's Marvin Tokayer's The Fugu Plan, which is also an interesting story, sort of related to this um, you know, some speculation there as well. There's Hill Levine's In Search of Sugihara, which is an excellent book. There's an Altamir, Yerchesca Leitner, who wrote a book quite some many years ago, Operation Torah Rescue. There's Reb David Mandelbaum's account of Yeshiva's Chachme Lublin in Shanghai, that condition. There's also a great little book by a very competent researcher in Betar about the Amshin of a Rebbe, and his role in the escape and his activities in Shanghai, um, he, he, he escaped there. Also, it's in Hebrew, excellent book. Of course, Dr. David Kranzler's doctorate and his extensive research for decades on the topic of the refugee community in Shanghai. There's another Altamir, Bachanan Hertzman, who also researched and wrote on it. There's a Tyru Masaira documentary that interviewed some Altamirs like Meisha Zupnik and others um, about the story of the Mir escape to Shanghai. Um, uh, Nathan Gutwirt and his family have, you know, did research and left behind an archive. There's also the role of the Lewin family and their subsequent research. 
Um, one of the main central figures of the whole entire escape was Zorach Varhaftig, who later was a minister in the state of Israel and one of the leaders of Mizrahi, signer of the Declaration of Independence. So he um, was a central figure in the whole escape plan, and he wrote an excellent book. It's one of the main great sources uh, of this whole story. It's called Refugee and Survivor. Um, Ephraim Zuroff has some stuff on it as well and some articles and in his book uh, the Sugihara Museum in Kovna where I bring groups quite often it's an excellent museum and has a lot um, about the topic of Sugihara and his visas it's a great museum, it's actually in the home where Sugihara both lived on the upper floor and on the downstairs is was his office and there's like a, it's, it's really great, I love bringing groups there um, not enough has been written about the roles of the Dutch consuls, LPJ de Decker and Jan Zwartendijk, um, and, and also the Polish consul, by the way. I uh, forgot his name. Uh, we'll talk about him as well. Um, but I've read some stuff about them. There's lots more out there that I've read and viewed. There's uh, watched interviews with Vareftig and other and others. There's loads of articles and many lectures over the years. There's also a great series, a podcast series by Professor Mark Shapiro on this topic. And then there's the whole Chabad story also. There's a Taim Chetmimim Yeshiva that was also in Japan and Shanghai. It was Vilna, Japan, Shanghai, the same exact route. Um, there's, uh, and there's, you know, that's, that's one component of the Chabad story. And there's also the original Russian Jewish community uh, had a strong Chabad presence, including its legendary rabbi, Rav Meir Ashkenazi, who was a Lubavitcher Chassid. Um, and a, along with the Polish refugees came this, also this contingent of Taimchei Tamimim. There's loads been written about uh, their sojourn there as well. In fact, my good friend Nachum Shmar Yahu Zions has done some serious archival research and uncovered much in this regard over the years and has graciously shared with me much of his findings. And I modestly made some of my own personal contributions uh, in several meetings I've had over the years. Um, one time I had the privilege of uh, meeting a Chinese historian um, and she um, shared with me a lot of her research that she did on the topic. She wrote her doctorate on the German Jewish speak, German speaking Jewish community in Shanghai, refugee community. Like I said, primarily from Vienna, there was some actual German Jews there as well. So she uh, she was helpful, and um, and and I also met a Japanese Christian couple from Kobe, Japan, and they enlightened me about the whole story of how the Kobe Jewish community, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kobe Christian community, which was a very small minority in Japan, in fact, they were a discriminated against minority in Japan, and they were actually the ones who uh, assisted the Jewish refugees when they arrived in Kobe, Japan, being that they understood them as a minority refugee community. So, that was interesting angle to hear from them. They had done some research on the topic. And I also met a Japanese journalist here in Israel. Uh, she was also from Kobe, and she came over to my house, and, and we spoke quite some extensively about the topic. She's also done quite a bit of research about the sojourn of the Mir and the refugees in Kobe, Japan, that stage of the, of the, of the, of the, of the trip. So I'm going to incorporate all of that. Now, what's going to make this series unique is that it's going to make an attempt to bring some clarity to the topic, um, which is, you know, famous. It's so famous that nobody even knows it. That's, that's how famous it is. I also want to organize the information because a lot of what people do know is disorganized. And the main goal is to dispel many of the myths surrounding the story, and there are quite a few uh, uh, myths. Uh, there's actually one of the primary goals of this series is to dispel the many, many myths surrounding this amazing story. It's a good enough story that it stands on its own merits, and I've also found that the mythology uh, that's been added to it is damaging to understanding the broader narrative and context. Also, as a believing Jew, I believe that miraculous is also to be found in the natural uh, occurrences of history. It's like the Purim story. We don't need to necessarily seek out the Kriyas, Kriyas Yamsuf each time to find the supernatural. Um, so, you know, we, we, can, we can manage with the, uh, with the natural too. Um, that's, that's fine, even though it's, it, was, it was quite miraculous in, 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 uh, in it, in, 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 on its own merits. I'll just give you one example that I'm remembering now. Uh, my daughter came home from her her Beis Yaakov uh, last year, 
with a story that her teacher told her that the uh, that the Mir Yeshiva they they uh, escaped across the Trans Siberian Railroad, and it was the first and only time the Trans Siberian Railroad was ever used. So Hashem made a miracle that this whole railroad should be built just to transport the Mir Yeshiva. So I. My poor daughter. So I wrote a note to the teacher. I said, you know, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was one of the busiest railroads in the entire world. It was a single track rail and it carried all merchandise uh, that was exported to the Far East through from Moscow to Vladivostok. So from European Russia to the other end of Russia, the Soviet Union, eventually. And it was an incredibly busy railroad. It was already used during the Russo-Japanese war, even before it was finished. In 1905, and it was finally finished, so that it was used in war, it was used for business, for commerce, for imports, for exports, it was definitely used for many years before the Mirishiva, and this is even more surprising, it's still in use today, and it is still a very busy railroad for commerce in today's Russia, so it's been in use for well over a hundred years, and uh, probably for many years to come. That's just one little tiny thing, um, and and... My daughter brought the note to the teacher, and the teacher was actually very receptive. It was nice. He said, oh, thank you so much for enlightening us with this uh, tidbit of information. In any event, so the on the eve of World War II, uh, the Polish Jewry is the center of world Jewry. It's the largest Jewish community in Europe. There's 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland. Um, there is... There is a a flourishing of Jewish life on one hand, and there's also challenges because it's a terrible economy, uh, especially during the Great Depression. A lot of poverty, not a lot of hope. There's significant anti-Semitism, um, and and it's 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 a on one hand they're at home there, they're Polish Jewry. On the other hand, it's a not a great situation for Polish Jewry on the eve of the war. Mir Yeshiva and the Yeshiva world specifically is in an area of Poland that we would normally associate with either Lithuania or Belarus. But in the interwar period, it was part of Poland, the Kresy region, which was northeastern Poland in the interwar period. And it was in the borders of the Second Polish Republic, the Mir Yeshiva. The Mir Yeshiva was the largest Yeshiva in the world at the time. It had over 400 students on the eve of the war, according to the sources I've seen. There are those who say, no, it was only 300. I, I, ben Sion Klobanski, who's pretty reliable, he says there are over 400. And these come from official documents of the Varha Yeshivas and the Joint and these types of arch- archives, so I tend to believe it. But um, the, the, uh, so the Mir Yeshiva is a large yeshiva, a very prestigious yeshiva, probably the most prestigious and largest yeshiva in the world. Um, and that is the situation before the war breaks out. And then we come to the most significant event, one of the most significant events of the 20th century, and it's unfortunately overlooked. It's even brushed over in many parts of the world. The non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany that signed on August 23rd, 1939, literally one week before the outbreak of World War II with the Nazi invasion of Poland on September 1st, so a week before that, the world is shocked by the two sworn enemies, uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, Hitler and Stalin, the two opposites, uh, the extreme right of Nazism and the extreme left of communism, somehow are able to make this non-aggression pact. It's known to posterity as the Molotov von Ribbentrop non-aggression pact. Uh, I probably not probably for sure mispronouncing his first name, Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister, and Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister, signed this pact in Moscow. And the reason that it's so such an important uh, and very often overlooked piece of history is that how how extremes can meet and and how the world was so shocked by it. Um, the these two political and ideological enemies um, are able to meet because extremes can meet at the extreme. Uh, a, a, the political spectrum is the ideological and political spectrum is not 180 degrees, in which case the two extremes are very far from each other. It's actually 360 degrees, like a circle, and therefore the the extremes meet at at that point. Um, and that is a big lesson to be learned about the extreme on the right and the left. 
One of the reasons it's not so famous is because the Soviet Union wanted to flush this down the memory hole, to use an Orwellian phrase. In fact, Orwell parodied this this pact in both uh, Animal Farm and in 1984 because it was so important to him that that, that Stalin could go ahead and make this pact with Nazi Germany. Um, it, it meant it meant something. It meant uh, it meant the, you know the betrayal of uh, you know of the of the extremes. Um, and uh, and and in in the Soviet Union, obviously wanted to flush this down the memory hole. I remember when I went to the uh, the Great Patriotic War Museum in Minsk in, in Belarus. So you, you you know it's about the whole world World War Two from from the perspective of the Soviet Union, from the perspective of Belarus, which was a battleground for much of World War Two, and was occupied by the Nazis for for much of World War Two. So. The they had the the Molotov and Ribbentrop Pact was mentioned in the museum. You got to give them credit, but it was it was like mentioned in you know you had to like really use a microscope. It was one little sentence and maybe a little picture, and that was it. You know you didn't want to want to want to forget about that if we can um, that part of the story um, that they were allies at one point, um, and this pact was that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany would not fight each other for at least the next 20 years, and they would have all kinds of commercial agreements and shipping grain and raw materials and, and, and payments and all kinds of deals and collective uh, 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 um, you know, treaties that they made with this pact. And, um, uh, you know, there's definitely all kinds of reasons why Hitler didn't want a two-front war. Stalin felt isolated from the West, the, the the straw that broke the camel's back was the Munich agreement with Hitler, and Stalin had not been invited to that. In other words, he seemed to be have been being being pushed to the background by the Western powers, England and France. Um, so he he decided that he has to throw in his luck with Hitler um, because just a couple of years before, in 1937, 1938, Stalin had uh, purged the Red Army um, of his his purges of. of uh, Within the Soviet Union and within um, within the ranks of the Communist Party and everything, so he he had you know the, the, he he killed I think over thirty thousand officers of the Red Army. So they had no leadership. They had to rebuild the Red Army. He needed time, and he definitely didn't want to be fighting Hitler. So uh, they each had their pragmatic reasons. No one, neither side, thought it would be forever. Um, Hitler, as as Rib von Ribbentrop was signing it, he was already planning the, to break it, uh, to, to invade the Soviet Union eventually, when the time came, when the time was ripe. Um, but the secret clause of the agreement was the division of Poland. Um, so this this was a very important part of the treaty. Now, Hitler never planned on honoring it for 20 years, and Stalin suspected as such, such like I said, it was still convenient for both uh, at, at the time. It was broken less than two years later on June 22, 1941. Operation Barbarossa with Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. It became the main front of World War II and one of the greatest scenes of the Holocaust. Um, so this secret clause becomes a very big part of the story. The secret clause is to divide Poland in half. When the German army would, was going to invade Poland, they were only going to take over western and central Poland. The Red Army was to invade eastern Poland and annex eastern Poland into the Soviet Union. That was a secret clause that only came to light after the war. Obviously, it came to light as soon as the, Soviet, as the Red Army invaded. But it only became clear that that had been a secret clause in the agreement, in the pact, in the molotov von ribbentrop non-aggression pact. Um, after the war. So the outbreak of the war, September 1st, 1939, the German army, the Wehrmacht, invades Poland on the western side. On September 17th, the Red Army of the Soviet Union invades eastern Poland. So the early days of the German occupation of Poland is much talked about, the humiliation to Jews and and the atrocities that are perpetrated by the German army and the early SS at that time, and then there was the beginning of ghettoization. That's all in Western and Central Poland. It's not in Eastern Poland. Eastern Poland is invaded by the Red Army from se September 17th and on. The Polish military collapsed, um, and and they eventually 
um, the Soviets solidify control over eastern Poland. And it has a very big impact on civilian life, especially on the Jewish population. This because there's a Soviet rapid Soviet Sovietization, uh, communism and Sovietization of, you know, nationalizing businesses and arrests of intellect intellectuals, politicians, writers, um, whatever Soviets do whenever they take over an area. Now this is El Yom Nerayim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchas Torah. In the mirror, they're in eastern Poland, and therefore they are never under the Nazi uh, control uh, in, in, of, in Poland. They are under the Soviets, and the the they are they need don't know what to do. The Soviets are anti-religion, atheist, very anti-religion. It's part of the whole world view of the communist uh, uh, philosophy, and now they're celebrating the last El and Yom Narayim and Sukkot Simsim in the mirror other yeshivas as well, and it's wartime, it's panic, no one knows what the future is going to hold, danger, both physical, because it's a war, and spiritual, because there's the Soviet takeover. And then we come to the next great story, which is also quite famous, but we're going to clarify some of the uh, points of this story, is that the Vilna district, the Vilna region, part of the Vilna region, including the city of Vilna, is returned to Lithuania. The Soviet Union, Stalin, basically, he decides to return an area that had historically been part of Lithuania, but Poland had controlled during the interwar period from 1920 until 1939. Lithuania wasn't happy about that, and actually during the interwar period there was no diplomatic relations between Poland and Lithuania. You couldn't cross the border, you couldn't, I don't think you could even send mail, um, so the Jewish communities of Lithuania and Poland were actually not in any contact, pretty much. They were cut off, completely cut off from each other during the entire 20 years in between the two world wars. Um, so the whole Vilna area is now is part of Poland, and of course it's in eastern Poland, so it's all under the Soviets. It was never under the Nazis at this point, again, until the Nazis invade the Soviet Union less than two years later. And the decision is made by Stalin... Um, to to uh, uh, to return this area, this Vilna district, to Lithuania. Why did they do it? And why did Lithuania agree to it? So basically like this. On October 10th, remember, September 1st, the Germans invade western and central Poland. September 17th, the Red Army invades eastern Poland. So a few weeks later, October 10th, the, the Soviet-Lithuanian Mutual Assistance Treaty was signed. And this mutual assistance treaty that Lithuania was basically, you know, bullied into signing, they didn't have much of a choice, was that Stalin gave them on a silver tray. He said, here, take the Vilna region, including the historic city of Vilna, your historic capital. Look what I'm giving you. So gracious of Stalin to give that to Lithuania. And in exchange, 20,000 Soviet troops would be stationed in its territory, ostensibly to protect the western border of the Soviet Union uh, against a, a possible Nazi invasion that they would renege on their non-aggression pact. So Lithuania didn't have a choice. I mean, they're getting their historic capital back. So there was a price to pay to have 20,000 Soviet troops on their territory, which they knew would probably increase over time. Um, they kind of kind of knew that. It was clearly the beginning of the end for Lithuania as far as the Soviet Union was concerned. But they didn't really have a choice. In the meantime, Lithuania still had nominal into, in, independence. In other words, Lithuania is neutral. They're not part of the war. They're not under Nazi occupation. They're not under Soviet occupation. They're still basically a republic, somewhat democratic even, kind of like an independent country, tiny little country, uh, neutral, not part of the war. That's the status of Lithuania at this point. Now, to put things into context... The other Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, were also in the Soviet sphere of influence under the molotov von ribbentrop non-aggression pact. And Latvia and Estonia had to deal with similar Soviet advances at this time. They also had mutual assistance treaties made with the Soviet Union at the same time. So it wasn't unique to Lithuania. Even more interesting is that the Soviets made a similar ultimatum to Finland, 
wasn't just the Baltic states, it was Finland too, which historically had been part of the imperial czarist empire before the Soviet Union. But Finland turned down this ultimatum, it turned down this opportunity to have a mutual assistance treaty with the Soviet Union, and they decided to fight instead. And that led to the Winter War, the, the, the 1940, the war between Finland and, and the Soviet Union, and eventually led to Finland fighting, fighting on the side of Nazi Germany during the invasion of, of the Soviet Union in 1941. So the whole Lithuania-Soviet negotiations over Vilna need to be seen in the wider geopolitical context of what Stalin was doing at this time. So, from October 1939, Lithuania is independent, nominally at least, and following the phony war, Germany turns to the west, occupies most of Western Europe over 1940, uh, the Soviet Union fights the winter war against Finland, they solidify their control over eastern Poland, and then eventually in June 14th, 1940, there's a Soviet ultimatum to Lithuania that they need to install a new government in, in, uh, that's going to be more friendly to the Soviet Union and they want more troops on Lithuanian territory and the answer must be delivered by the next day. Um, right? So, so this whole thing lasted from October 1939 to June 1940, just a few months, uh, about eight months or so. Um, eight, eight, nine months, eight, eight and a half, nine months. And um, um, now, now bear in mind the June, mid June, June 14th, 1940, this is the last days of the battle for France. The whole world is completely focused on the imminent fall of France. No one noticed or cared what was taking place in the Baltics, and that's exactly why Stalin timed it for this time. So Lithuania was basically forced to accept this ultimatum, and on June 15th, the next day, the country was effectively occupied by Soviet forces. The Red Army's tanks rolled into Vilna and Kovna. Less than two months later, on August 3rd, 1940, Lithuania was officially incorporated into the Soviet Union. Now the timeline is, is extremely important to the story, um, because this is, this is the whole story of the, the Mir and all these other refugees of being in Lithuania, and after this, you know, August, when, when it's incorporated into the Soviet Union, there's an immediate and rapid Sovietization of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, the whole Baltic states. Less than a year later, in June 1941, Nazi Germany surprised its erstwhile ally, and on June 22, 1941, Operation Barbarossa invades the Soviet Union. Lithuania, which is now part of the Soviet Union, was right on the path of the Wehrmacht. And following the Wehrmacht were, of course, the SS Einsatzgruppen. And aided by local, many local Lithuanian collaborators, they wipe out most of Lithuanian Jewry during the summer of 1941. So we really jumped ahead of the story. But if we get back to the beginning of the war, now that we have the overall timeline in, in place... Polish Jewish refugees, here they're in a war zone, they're in the eastern Poland where the Soviets had occupied eastern Poland, some of them even came from Nazi-occupied western Poland, but they hear, this is in the news, it's on the radio, people hear about it, that Vilna is going to, and the whole area, the Vilna district, the Vilna region, is going to be returned from Soviet-occupied eastern Poland to the independent and neutral country of Lithuania. So, if you get to Vilna before the, is it a few weeks between, or a few days between the announcement and the official handover to Lithuania, so anyone who's there is essentially moved out of a war zone, moved out of Soviet occupation, into a neutral and independent country that's not part of the war, without crossing a border. No papers, you don't need any passport, you don't need any border crossing, no soldiers, no anything. You just have to be at the right place at the right time. So it's an incredible situation that everyone decides to take it, not everyone, many people decide to take advantage of, that just to be in Vilna or its environs, it's, it's this area where it's going to be returned to Lithuania, on the day that it's returned to Lithuania, and then you can be in independent Lithuania without crossing an international border. And that's what... Many yeshivas, including the Mir, and thousands and thousands of other Polish Jewish refugees, religious and secular, old and young, families and others, anyone who wanted to get away and was able to, it wasn't so easy, 
um, too, obviously. I can't have any, any uh, questions and why other people didn't avail themselves of this opportunity because it wasn't easy to get there. But anyone who could, it was an opportunity for, oh, which opened up for the refugees with the return of Vilna. So the, which ones ended up there and which ones didn't? Which, uh, which, which ended up in Vilna? So anyone who was able to, you had some money, you were able to pay for transportation. You didn't have a family that was holding you behind. Um, you were able to get through the clogged roads of refugees. Now, one demographic that was relatively easy for it to move was a yeshiva. Yeshiva was single students. The yeshiva could move as a unit. They weren't tied down by a job, by family connections, by little children, by any of that. And Reb Chaim Eiser Grzynski told all the yeshivas, he was the titular head of the yeshiva community, and in his capacity as the head of the Vada Yeshivas, and he said everyone should come to Vilna, and most yeshivas came among the thousands of refugees. And Lithuanian Jewry uh, received these refugees and, and was very hospitable to them. And uh, it was a very, very beautiful, uh, uh, actually, a display of these poverty-stricken Lithuanian Jews receiving thousands and thousands of Polish-Jewish refugees in their homes and soup kitchens and trying to house them in places. And really a, a, a story of its own merit. Um, so that is part one of this story. You notice we didn't get very far, but that's because there's a lot to say about this story, and I hope that this is interesting and compelling, and tell your friends and family about our series and about how we're going to continue it in this dramatic escape to Shanghai of thousands of Polish Jewish refugees, including the Mir Yeshiva. And um, this is Yehudi Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudiGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite po- podcast platform, and I hope you enjoyed.